amazing. Let's start, shall we? So let's go on to the next slide. So good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Thanks so much for joining today's webinar for the University of London's Bachelor's Degree of Computer Science Programme. My name's Nisha, I'm an enrollment counsellor. Joining me today are Anke and Diana, fellow enrollment counsellors from Coursera, who will be monitoring the live chat for your questions. We also have Naomi uh, joining us from marketing today, who will be monitoring the slides, so thank you for that. Um, and I'm also very excited to announce that we have our guest from the University of London, the program Program Director Dr. Matthew King, who will be joining us in today's webinar later on to answer live Q&As and to go through some of the questions that you guys have put forward. So in today's webinar, we have a lot to cover. We'll start off with program overview, where you'll get to learn more about the program structure and what the online format really looks like. We'll then delve into the tuition fees, admissions and the application processes, and then we'll end off with a live Q&A with Dr. Matthew Yu King. So as the presentation goes along, feel free to type your questions in. If you have anything specific for Dr. Matthew Yu King, please do label it so we can answer those. But before we get started, we do have a very short clip for you to watch from Kyle. A current student in the programme, he was actually our guest star from our previous webinar. If you would like to watch that um, and what he said, Anka will drop this into the chat box below. But let's get started and let's watch what Kyle has to say about the computer science degree. On to the next. When I was 14, I fell in love with video games. I looked online to see if I could find any courses that offered computer science or games development. I'm getting my bachelor's degree online from the University of London on Coursera. It was affordable and just having that flexibility was really nice. There are so many things that you could be and if you want to be it, you could be it on Coursera. To earn your degree from a world-class university online, apply today at Coursera.org. I love hearing from students and understanding what they think about the program. Best kind of advice, don't you think? So let's talk about the program. So let's talk about the program length. The program is between three to six years, which means you can complete the degree as quick as three years if you decide to do full time. Or if you wish to complete the 23 modules in your own pace, you can go up to six years. Now, that's not necessarily meaning you have to take the six years, but if you decide that you want to do a full-time load, that would mean that you do four modules per semester. A semester is six months long. If you decide to do part-time, that's two to three modules per semester. But you have the amazing flexibility to choose and vary your course load. You can even take a semester off if you need to. Whatever you decide to do, it will just determine how quickly you finish the degree. So remember, if you want to do part-time, it will take four to five years. If you do full-time, it will take you up to three years. But every semester, you pick and choose if you want to do full-time or part-time. Now, let's talk about the curriculum. The curriculum was designed to give you a very strong foundation about computer science, a specialized knowledge of topics such as data science, AI, web development. It will cover industry and academic case studies to help apply what you've learned in terms of real world problems. And throughout the program, you will create a portfolio of coursework and projects to present to employers. Now, in the UK, a bachelor's degree is typically three years. That's why you'll see that the program is structured into three levels, uh, level four, five and six, um, as this does follow the UK framework of higher education. Um, each module is worth 15 credits um, and the final project is worth 30 credits. So altogether, you will have 360 credits to earn your Bachelor's of Computer Science degree program. And just to let you know, this is a UK honours bachelor's degree, which is a level six qualification. In the program, you'll learn uh, programming languages such as JavaScript, C++, Python, and C Sharp. In level four, you'll complete eight compulsory modules that will cover the fundamentals about computer programming with a special project on web applications. This is where you'll learn JavaScript and cover the client-side web languages such as HTML and CSS. When you go on to level five, you'll complete another eight compulsory modules. They'll be covering programming skills where you'll learn to load uh, JS and build web server applications and data applications like SQL. Um, then you'll move on to C++, which sets you up for physical computing games and development. You'll tackle Python in level five with modules such as uh, programming data and software design, which sets you up for AI and machine learning and doing some work with C Sharp using Unity framework in the gaming modules. And lastly, in level six, you'll complete six elective modules along with a final project that combines your knowledge and skills to create a software system in line with your specialism. In level six, you get to pick and choose the level modules that you want to do. Everybody takes the same modules at level five and level six is where you differentiate. So you have time to change and or register on a specialism all the way up until 
level six as well. So don't worry if you've picked one now and you decide to change your mind in a few years time, that's totally okay, it's understandable. So if you do choose to do the general route, you'll have a bit more flexibility to choose your level six modules and what your final project is based on. Um, the final project will consist of both coursework and a written exam, about 80 to 20 weighting ratio, including proposal, process logs and reports and a presentation. So if we go on to slide five, I'd like to talk to you a bit more about the online format. So the program is delivered entirely online through the Coursera platform same degree you would receive if you were studying on campus. Your final degree certificate and transcripts don't state it's online and it doesn't state that it's from Coursera either. It will be from the University of London Goldsmith. As it's an online course, there is no live attendance required, which is great. So students from all over the world can study this program whenever you can. With it being online, you really can study at your own schedule from the comfort of your own home or wherever you are in the world and log on whenever you have time in the mornings, the evenings or the weekends. I don't know about you, but I much prefer being able to do it in the weekend when I have a bit more time away from work. In terms of time commitment, you can expect to commit an average of five to seven hours per week for one module. So it's up to you on how you manage that time. Those hours would include watching pre-recorded video lectures, completing quizzes, programming assignments, readings, and peer reviews. Um, although there are no live lectures, there are live webinars hosted by tutors. These tutors will run live webinars at different times, twice weekly. It's a great opportunity to go through coursework covered that week and receive guidance on assessments. They're super helpful, and you'll find that some live webinars um, tutors will share additional insights and you'll also get to interact with your classmates joining from all over the world, which is great. And so I'd highly encourage you to attend them if you can. Uh, they tend to host a few more webinars on the math components. So if you're anything like me and struggle a little bit on mathematics, this is a great position for you to go in and ask those questions. Um, and if you can't, don't worry, these webinars will be recorded for you to watch back on, which is great. So it gives you some time to have flexibility. Aside from Coursera, you'll also need to regularly check your student portal through the University of London. The student portal is a gateway to all of your additional learning resources, which does include your VLE, which is the virtual learning environment. Here, you will find the most up-to-date information, including registration dates, exam dates, as well as wonderful resources to support your development, such as well-being material, career development, exercises, and student support services as well. Let's go on to the next slide. Thanks. So if you've already taken a course online on Coursera, this setup will look pretty familiar to you. I always recommend to anyone considering studying a degree program online that they should try a course on the Coursera platform first. Now, it's a great opportunity to get a feel for the platform before committing long term. University of London specifically offers great open content courses if you want to take a look. Diana is going to share in the link in the chat box below so that you can have a look too. And what a typical day might look like for you is that you'll log on to Coursera and you'll see the courses you've registered for on your dashboard. You'll notice that the coursework is broken down into weekly pre-recorded video lectures, quizzes and programming assignments. As mentioned, there's no live attendance required. So that just means you can study at your own schedule from anywhere in the world, so long as you have a good, uh, computer and good internet access. Something to highlight is that through each course, you'll see discussion prompts as you move through the content. These are check-in points to encourage you to participate and interact with your peers throughout the program. And exams are being taken place online. Exams take place from Monday to Saturday and are typically two hours multiple choice and objective based where you type your code into a text editor. Exams take place at the end of the semester when you finish your modules. So typically around uh, September and March time. So you'll have plenty of time to know when your exams are due. So if you have any concerns, let your academic tutors know about it. You're given a 24 hour window to access your exam modules. And once you begin your attempt, you have the allotted two hours to complete the entire assessment. Instructions in your exams are specific to your module, so you'll need to refer to your admissions notice. But let's talk about this on the next slide. Thank you. So I want to talk about tuition. This is a frequently asked question that we have from students. So tuition is based on your residency and not nationality, and it's pay per module. There are different fees based on if you live in a band A, band B, or if you're based in the UK. If you don't know which country band you fall under, you can check this on the university's website. Anki will add the link for the country bands in the chat box below so that you can take a look. So here on the screen, you can see that there is a range from band A to band B and the UK. 
This is the total indicated cost for the program for all 23 modules. So if you live in a band A, the total indicated cost is 12,654 and each 15 credit module is 490 pounds. If you live in band B, the total indicated cost is 18,840 pounds and each module is 736 pounds. If you live in the United Kingdom, the total indicated cost is £17,110 and each module is £667. You can find the details about your module fees here on the university's website. Diana will drop this into the chat box below so that you can take the time to review this. Tuition is paid twice a year before the beginning of each term. So that would be mid-March and mid-September before April and October cohorts. You only have to pay for however many modules you study in the semester. So remember, full-time is four modules, part-time is two to three. You pay your tuitions directly to the University of London through their student portal. Students can pay their fees via online, uh, via credit card, debit card, flywire, bank transfer. There's multiple different ways of doing so. And if you wanna take a look about how to pay, Anka will drop that into the chat box below. Also, one question that we get a lot is if the university offers scholarships and bursaries. Learners must check their eligibility requirements before applying, but Anka will drop this into the chat box below now for you to have a review. The programme is eligible for student finance loans for UK residents. Students can apply for student finance for part-time and full-time studies, but are not eligible for maintenance loan. For students who are applying for an undergraduate loan, I'd highly recommend reading through the information on the university's website, and please ensure that you select University of London Worldwide on your application. If your loan is not confined by the time of registration deadline, you can still register and pay for your modules, but I'd keep the receipt so you can get the refund. Diana will drop this into the chat box below for any students based in the UK who want to look at student finance loans. And just to let you know, if we could go back, please, I apologise. Thank you. Um, for those who have received an offer, if you register and pay before September the 11th, you will receive free access to one of the following certificates from Coursera. It's the Google IT Support Certificate, Introduction to Computer Science, or the Object Orientated Programming Specialization. However, if you cannot pay before September the 11th, the final deadline to register and pay for your modules is September 25th of 2023. And for those who have yet to apply for the programme, the University of London will charge an application processing fee of £60, which is non-refundable and non-transferable. Thank you. If we can go on to the next slide, please. Thanks. So to start, there are two admissions routes into the programme. They're standard entry and performance based. Given that applicants come from many different countries, the University of London accepts qualifications from all over the world. So the best way to go and check if you meet the admissions requirements is to go directly to the University of London's website and select from the drop down of countries of which you completed your education in. Diana will drop this into the chat box below so that you can check from what country that you've studied, what your qualification will be. To give you an example, for standard entry route, if you've completed your education within the United Kingdom, you'll need at least three UK GCSEs from a grade A to C and two UK A levels from a grade A to E. Maths must be either included at GCSE or A level. If you meet these requirements, you will be eligible for the standard entry route. However, if you don't, you can still be eligible to apply through the performance-based route. Now, we get this question a lot about what the difference is. So let me go through this with you now. The performance-based route is for applicants who don't meet the standard entry requirements. However, in order to be eligible for the performance-based route, you need to meet one of the following requirements. Again, as an example, if you've completed your uh, qualifications in the UK, if you have four UK GCSEs or relevant WAC experience, you might meet the requirements for the performance-based route you'll be eligible to apply and your application would be reviewed on an individual basis. If you're accepted through the performance-based route, you'll need to pass both Introduction to Programming 1 and either Computational Mathematics or Discrete Mathematics within your first semester with a weighted average of 40% or above in order to progress into the next semester. And to clarify, you will take those modules once the session begins. These modules are part of the program, all students must take them, but just to note, you'll only be able to study part-time in the first semester if you've been accepted through performance-based. Thank you. If we can go on to the next slide. Great. So applications are now open and they will close on September the 11th, which is next Monday. So to start your application, you can apply online through the University of London's portal. Anka will drop this into the chat box below now, should you wish to apply.
Now, if you're unsure as to which admissions route you're eligible for, the University of London recommends that you apply through the standard entry route. And if you don't meet the standard entry requirements, your application will automatically be considered for the performance-based admissions. Please ensure that you do not make duplicate entries. If you have done so, please let us know under which email address you have used so that we can help you. But I'm going to break down a few of the application components to ensure you submit a very strong and complete application and hopefully calm some nerves. But you'll need to upload a scanned copy of your ID with your name and birth date on it. Typically, a birth certificate, passport, or a driver's license will be sufficient. Um, you'll need to write a personal statement of 100 to 150 words. Um, and the question is, why do you wish to study for the program? So really make your personal statement shine. Talk about your uh, motivations for doing so. Thirdly, you'll then need to upload a scanned copy of your official academic transcripts and the certificates themselves. If your documents are not in English, you'll also need to provide English translated copies. You'll need to upload your resume, so ensure that you'll update your information and highlight any successes in your career. And if you've completed any other relevant courses or certificates like the ones on Coursera, uh, you can upload those documents as well. If English is in your first language, you will need to submit an English proficiency test score. Um, if you're working in the medium instruction of English with your employer for over 18 months, you can provide a letter uh, stating from your employer about this. Or if you've studied in the past five years in English, you can provide that as evidence too. Um, altogether, the application should take you about 20 to 30 minutes to complete. Once you've submitted it, they will ask you to pay for an application fee of £60, which is non-refundable and non-transferable. And then you'll need to submit that payment so that your application goes through. All right. So say you've completed your application. I just want to give you a peek behind the curtains of what happens after you've submitted your application with the University of London. Let's go on to the next slide. Great. So for those in the process of applying, the deadline to submit is September the 11th, 2023. I'd highly recommend applying before the deadline as we have a new promotional offer that when students submit their applications, they can get access to study Meta's WhatsApp business platform for developers for free. So after you've submitted your application, you'll receive a confirmation email that your application has been received by the admissions office and a notification of your student reference number. Each application gets reviewed by the admissions committee and you'll receive communication within about five to 15 business days through email. Please note weekends are not included in this. If you're missing any documents, the university will reach out to you directly to request this for further evidence, so keep an eye out for any emails from them. Otherwise, you'll receive a decision on whether you've been accepted through standard route or performance. If you don't meet the admissions requirements, the admissions committee will advise you on any additional qualifications you may need in order to be eligible for the program. So after you've received your offer letter email, You'll find information regarding how to log into your student portal with a new username and password to register and pay for your modules and access your orientation course. After you've paid for your modules and a month before the big session begins, you will receive an email invite to link your Coursera account. You'll then need to complete your orientation course, which covers everything you need to get started in the program, such as how to navigate Coursera, program policies, um, communication can channels to help seek and connect with your peers. I'd highly recommend to do this um, as it will give you a lot of information. I've done it myself and I found it absolutely fascinating with all this information. There are some quizzes that you need to do in the orientation course. You'll need to pass these with at least 80% or above to receive access to your modules, but I can assure you they're not too hard and you will be okay. The session begins on October 9th of 2023, and you'll receive an announcement as soon as you have access to your registered modules become available. If you don't receive access to your modules once the session begins on October 9th, please contact the bsccs-support at london.ac.uk using the same email address you registered for with your degree program. Great, so if we go on to the next slide. So thanks so much for listening so far. Thank you to Anki and Diana, who I can see have been answering questions while the presentation has been going along and dropping the links into the chat box. And to those who have been asking questions, I really appreciate your interest and your candor. We're now going to be doing a live Q&A session with Dr. Matthew King, who I'm very excited to introduce you all to. Some of these questions that have been asked by those of you sending these questions in beforehand. If you have any more questions and you'd like to ask uh, Dr. Matthew King, feel free to drop them into the Q&A chat box and remember to label it for him so that we can answer those questions left at the end of today's session. But let's start. Hi, Matthew, how are you? Hello there. I'm uh, good, thank you. Yes. Oh, 
glad to hear it. It's lovely to see you again. I know we've done a webinar before, but it's always lovely to have you on board. Likewise. <laughs> Thanks so much. Well, we have so many questions and I'm super excited to start off them with you. So let's kickstart onto the first one, shall we? So I've had this question come in from a student and they mention what resources and support systems are in place for online students, such as academic advisors, technical support and access to library resources. Okay, so uh, let's start. Let's just go through those in turn. So we've got on um, systems for academic uh, advice. Uh, so um, we've got a kind of hierarchical structure for student support on the program, uh, academic support. So the academic support, which is support that relates to the material in a course where you need someone who knows about, you know, computer science to answer it, uh, that, that works like this. You have every module on the course has a module leader and all the module leaders are members of staff in in my department or our department at computing at goldsmiths so they're sort of faculty members and commonly they teach on campus as well as online and they are experts in in computer science uh, with phds and so on and so forth so uh, th those are your module leaders so every module on the program has one of those and then uh, you also have in and, and they, they run live webinars so they run three live webinars every module has three live webinars run by one of these members of staff every session so there's a sort of kickoff webinar at the beginning where you can ask questions about you know the module in general and they'll sort of explain how it works and then there's a midterm uh, webinar where the module leader will allow tell you all about the coursework the midterm coursework and what what you what's required and how you can do well and you can ask, ask questions and so on and then you have one at the end for the end of term coursework or exam so that's our sort of faculty led uh, support which uh, all students can access and then it sort of splits between uh, teaching center students and web supported students I'm guessing most people are going to be web supported students in this webinar, and if you're web supported, it means that on every module you're assigned an online tutor and they will answer your academic queries in the online forums on the Coursera platform and also they run some webinars as well uh, as and when they, they see that it's necessary typically in the bigger modules you have a lot of webinars that you can access and because you have multiple tutors on a given module what we do is any tutors that run any, any webinars we make them accessible to all students uh, on the web supported model um that's quite a long answer <laughs> but uh, that's the gen that's the academic support uh, model uh, technical support is provided by uh, typically by Coursera, but also sometimes the online tutors would support help with that as well. So, you know, how to access things on the platform and things like that. Uh, you can typically get that support from Coursera, but also uh, our, our sort of academics tend to help a bit with that as well. And then there's also the student uh, support team at, at University of London who have an, an email address you can email and, and sort of get support that way, which is more general support about the program sort of administrative support. And finally, the library, uh, the library is a there's an online library, a sort of fully sort of electronic online library, which has all kinds of stuff in it, not just computer science. So you get access to quite an interesting library. Imagine the University of London has a pretty, pretty wide range of books in there. But also, uh, you know, each module typically would have some sort of one or more textbooks assigned to it, which you would uh, access through the library, which you get access to through your account. Fantastic. Thank you. And I just wanted to expand on that as well for students. Um, if you do have any technical uh, questions, queries, Coursera is there to help you. They're open 24-7. They'll answer any questions that you need, but it's great that the University of London can help. Um, and just to double check with you, Matthew, with the library resources, if we have students in the UK who want to come visit on campus, even though they're an online student, would that be okay? Uh, so you can you can visit. There's sort of two campuses really. So you've got the you've got the University of London uh, in Russell Square, uh, and I believe I think you, there might be a physical library you can access. Actually, talking of libraries, but in general you can certainly go and visit the the sort of University of London and and, and check that out. But uh, also Goldsmiths campus, we do have people visiting us occasionally. It's always fun when people pop in, uh, but you know, we don't formally provide a kind of service as it were for people coming onto campus, but we, we've certainly met a few students who've popped in and uh, that's been fun. So yeah. It's always nice popping in and seeing some of your students, I'm sure, but that's great. Thank you. Let's go on to the next slide with the next question. 
So this question came from a student in um, Brazil, but they said, how often does the curriculum get updated to reflect the latest development in the field of computer science? Yeah, it's a great question. And, you know, we launched in 2019. Yes. And although, uh, so it's pretty, pretty up to date in, in that sense, but also some of the later modules, we kind of launched it uh, as in, in stages. So some of the late, the, the sort of the newest content on the degree, I would say, is from, you know, 2022, I think my AI module, I think I completed that one in early 2022. So it's fairly fresh. Uh, but we are also uh, at the moment developing a sort of redevelopment plan where we're sort of putting resources to redevelop uh, various modules across the program. So yeah, that's, that's the general thing. So I would say, you know, some of the modules have already been updated. Uh, at various points and tweaked and stuff so in terms of there are technical issues and things but uh relating to actually like say oh a whole new technology has appeared we need yeah. to uh, cover that then that, that's a slower process because obviously we there's a the, the university of london has to go through a quality process where you know academics look at the new program we're adding in and, and check it and, and so there's kind of a long process to be allowed to put new content in but we are in the process of doing that at the moment so yeah there, there will be updated and refreshed content coming uh, in the next couple of years that's fantastic i was going to ask if there was a particular date but if it's in the next few years that's wonderful um because i know the computer science field ai is constantly emerging with something brand new you know i even read something happening last week and i just thought it's incredible how much we've moved over since april 2019 when you first started the course yeah so um i when i met when i, I was just talking about the ai course it's quite an interesting example and yeah. So, so that one, we completed building that and launched the final bit of content on that in 2022. And I thought I was cool because I was using GPT-2, uh, but that sounds like ancient history now. But back in 2021, GPT-2 yeah. was kind of state of the art and they're worried about releasing it because people might use it for, you know, dangerous purposes or whatever. But now everyone's got it, you know, so it's, it's yeah, it, it moves faster than universities can, but we are, we are moving, I'll say that. <laughs> That's good. We've got to run and, you know, catch up with, uh, you know, machines and AIs and so forth. But it's great that the University of London are putting this in. So hopefully that should, you know, put some students at ease with understanding more about the curriculum. But thank you for answering that. I'll, I'll make one more comment as well, though. So, I mean, th this is always this is a perennial problem. It's always been the problem with computer science is that it keeps moving. So what we try and do is, is design the modules in a way where, yes, we try and put reasonably up to date content. But on the other hand, it's more about giving people confidence to learn the new technologies as they come along because whatever whatever we teach you in the degree once you're off the degree in a year's time new technologies will come out anyway so the point is that that you as a student should be ready to and, and confident in learning new technologies so we do expose you to a wide range of different technologies and what are, some of the learning objectives for the program relate to you know, you being confident about making decisions about technologies to use. So if you get a job where you've been asked, oh, what, which AI model or whatever should we be using for this? You know, you should be able to go, okay, what are the latest ones? What's the most appropriate one? How do I evaluate it and make a decision? So it's that process, not just knowing the, the very latest acronym technology, whatever, it's about having mm -hmm. confidence to be able to evaluate a piece of technology as well. That's a really good point. And I think the confidence being built from a university degree, especially one from the University of London Goldsmith, I think will really give a lot of people confidence and a boost to be able to speak about it in, to their employers. Because like you said, uh, technology constantly changes. I'm always am amazed by it all. So oh, that's great. Thank you. So let's go on to the next slide, shall we? Ah, so we have this student ask a question of how is the online learning experience designed to be engaging and interactive for remote students? Yeah, so that's, a, that's another great question and, you know, something I've worked on for years. So the first online course I actually worked on was in 2013. So 10 years ago now, so 10th anniversary this year was actually a, a, a big course on Coursera uh, where we had 100,000 people on it and it was all very exciting back in the early days of Coursera. And so I've, I've been working on this for years and thinking really hard about this and so we what we've tried to do with the program is put in a whole range of different types of content to try and give people lots of ways of accessing the material and learning about it so we have there's the, the course is quite video heavy so there's lots of videos but what we try and do is then not just we don't want you just to binge the videos so we try yeah. and kind of like uh push push it back onto you and ask you some questions so you'll find there's like interactive quizzes that happen after most of the videos to sort of 
to wake you up <laughs> to check if you, you so you go back and check whether you understood the video that kind of thing so there's lots of kind of back and forth in that in that way but also we've tried to use the full sort of range of capabilities of the Coursera platform and that's one of the you know great things about working with Coursera is is having this state-of-the-art learning platform which uh, has been developed to be highly interactive so we use things like uh, for example um, these uh, a browser-based programming environment where we uh, for the C++ course when you're just starting out with C++ it can be really hard to make it work on your machine basically to just get to that point where you've run that first program so what we do is we use the Coursera labs environment to create a, a sort of basically a virtual machine inside your browser so you get a fully spec'd up C++ development environment you can just go straight in and start using without having to do all kinds of complicated installs you do the installs in the second half of the course when you're ready but still it's that kind of thing so getting you we have to when we're teaching we have to decide where do we want the student to spend their time and how do we keep them engaged and one of those things as i say is is identifying okay well it's not the right time to learn all the bits about how to install this stuff now we just want you to write the code so we provide an environment that allows that and so yeah and we've got there's some games as well uh, so we have a um a sort of research student who works with us and as, as our learning designer on 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 the uh, goldsmiths and he's actually at a conference presenting about his development of games within the program right now uh, in Portugal so a, a sort of um, intelligent games conference and yeah so and, and there's so so they help teach you about algorithms and things like that in an interactive way so that's another example of stuff we put in there to make it engaging I think that's fantastic and you mentioned a really good point I mean you started doing online learning back in 2013 that's 10 years ago look how far we've moved in the past 10 years and the fact that you know it's great to understand that the University of London are trying to make the content engaging making sure um same with the videos on the Coursera platform you know it's great that it stops the certain points to really make sure that you're paying attention ask you questions I love that part because it really makes me kind of go okay I'm not just watching a video I'm trying to make sure that I can really understand the topic but thank you I think that's great let's go on to the next question okay so how does the online program maintain its quality and reputation compared to traditional on-campus programs yeah uh, yeah so um essentially we use a lot of the same processes uh, so in terms of uh, how you know so there's quality has different meaning very specific meanings in in, in uh, you know university higher education sector uh, so the idea of quality relates to verifying if your degree has the correct things in it to meet the criteria for a, for a given subject right so that's one aspect of it so when we were designing the original curriculum for the degree there was quite an elaborate process where we had to produce all kinds of documentation describing what we were planning to do what i learned each module what it was going to be uh, how we were going to assess it all this kind of stuff and that's get that gets carefully reviewed by multiple sort of external reviewers and it goes through all kinds of different boards that look at it and check so that's that's the sort of basic design before you even get to start making any content right so it gets verified in in that way and that's that's the same as on campus same as in fact it was more rigorous than i've experienced on campus to be honest uh so that's one thing and also because you've got two institutions working on it they tend to both run the process almost twice so it's kind of a double process so that's one thing that assures that the basic design of the program is is appropriate and the, the sort of way that it's being assessed is appropriate uh, and then up from there uh we then once the program's up and running you've got another thing about quality of like you know how do you know that the that the assessment is secure and that kind of thing and that that whereas you know on campus maybe we just get the student to sit in an exam hall so we know right. okay that student is the same person that took that exam you know uh, whereas online that's a bit trickier so when the program first launched actually in 2019 the very first session we did run our exams in exam centers so again just the same as we would on campus really so people sitting in rooms but obviously 2020 we all know what happened then um, and so we suddenly went online with all of our uh, exams and that process has iterated and this session for example we're actually launching a new exam platform which is in ensuring the sort of rigorousness of the exams is is, in is almost increased from what it was before uh, so it's sort of a fully proctored system and that is and that is 
people find it a bit annoying that you have to be proctored, which means you have a camera on and it captures your screen and things like that. But actually, the only reason we do it is is is, is all about quality and reputation, so that people know, yeah, the exams that are taken on this degree have been ca- you know carefully um, managed and and checked and proctored. Therefore we can trust the grades that come out of that. So that's another aspect of, of the quality. So there's, yeah, there's a whole bunch of other stuff I could talk about there, but that gives you a bit of a flavor of how, how, it, how it goes. No, absolutely. And thank you for informing the students about that. Yes, exams are taking place online. And like we mentioned, they're always at the end of every module, but it, I, I find that whether that be a webcam looking at me or an exam invigilator looking at me, exams are always nerve wracking, no matter what, if you're doing it online, if you're doing it on an attendance center, but yeah, if you, Students, if you have any questions, if you have any concerns, reach out to someone at the University of London for that kind of help. But thank you, Matthew. That's a really great answer. And it was great to understand a bit more about the quality of it all. Um, let's go on to the next question. So are there any opportunities for students to engage with real world projects, uh, case studies even, or internships to gain practical experience in the field? Yeah, so we don't have um, an internship sort of built into the program. So some programs you can you you go and work somewhere and you get some credit that feeds into your program. We don't actually have that yet, uh, but what we do have is a really strong careers uh, sort of system that comes with the degree, where there are regular webinars where they uh, opportunities for internships and all kinds of stuff is communicated and how to prepare your CV. There's all kinds of workshops that happen. We've got a fantastic uh, careers lead who works on all that. So it's a really uh, interesting part of the degree relating to you know internships, I guess, but also the wider development of yourself as you, as you go through, which is what the sort of big subject here. And in terms of real world projects, um, so I guess that means that's similar to internships, right? So the idea that you do a project for your employer well um we do in order to retain control over what the content of a project is we're fairly um what's the word uh, we, we specify very clearly what what the projects are that you have to do uh, but there's a certain amount of flexibility in there so for example you know when you do a final project at the end of the degree uh, you know there's there's a, a project relating to gather your own data set and then train a couple of different neural network architectures to analyze it, something like that. And, you know, the actual data set that you use is up to you. So a lot of people are working uh, even in, in, in the um, field already. And those people sometimes choose data sets that are relevant to their employer. And you can do that. So you can do, you know, you can bring some of your work into your, your final project in that way. Uh, and there is that flexibility. That's great. I think that's good that students can do that if they want to. And um, for students who have come in as complete novices, um, maybe they've never studied computer science before. Um, do you feel like this would be a good program for them to study and then maybe try to get into work experience within the computer science field as well? Uh, yeah, so uh, we've absolutely you know, designed the program so that if you come in at level four, which is the first level, remember, uh, when you come in, uh, we're not assuming that you know how to program. Uh, obviously, if you do know how to program, those first few programming modules will be a bit easier for you. And, and there's not much we can do about that. But uh, if you don't know how to program, we have designed those modules so that they take you from nothing to uh, you know, a decent level of programming capability, for example. And the same with the maths. We don't assume any more maths than required. It's not like you say, well, you can get in with, you know, if you've got this kind of A-level maths, and then suddenly we just step up and don't teach you the bits in between. Uh, so we, we do, we're very careful to step you from wherever you are to where you need to be to complete the program. Well, that's really good. I'm sure that will calm a lot of nerves of students as well. I'm, I mean, I'm a complete novice. I did a Python course back in 2020, and I wouldn't know anything about it. So maybe a computer science degree might be a good fit for me too. So let's go on to the next slide, shall we? So are there options for specializations within the computer science program that focus on specific areas like um, AI, cybersecurity or software engineering? We're having a lot of students who are very interested within those fields, especially within AI and cybersecurity, because obviously they're very hot topics at the moment. Yeah, so we don't, I'll, I'll start with what we don't have. So we don't have an explicit specialization in cybersecurity or software engineering yet. Uh, but we've certainly we're kind of looking as i say we're doing some work on sort of redeveloping the program or, or, or putting some development time into the program at the moment and cybersecurity is something we're kind of looking at there uh, but nothing 
firm yet, but uh, what we do have is multiple specialisms in other areas. So we do have an AI and machine learning specialism, and we have a VR uh, specialism and a games development specialism and a web web and mobile and a user experience one. And so, and, and the idea with these specialisms is at level six, which is the final level of the degree, there are optional modules, right? So if you just, if you don't choose a specialism, you, you've got, I think, 14 different modules you can take and you would take uh, six of those plus a project. So you choose six out of the 14 and then you do a project. But the way the specialisms work is we, we, we've selected certain modules for you and we say, well, if you're if you want to be a specialist in machine learning and AI and you want that in your certificate, then you need to take this combination of level six modules. Plus, there's a couple of optional ones, I think. So you kind of have a core set that you take and then there's some optional ones. And they, the, the idea is that they, they work together to give you that specific skill set. Similarly, with games, for example, you know, we say, well, if you take this, this and this, then we, we would consider you to have a specialism in games. And you'd also typically do a project if you do a specialism in AI, your project would be in the area of AI or, or neural networks in, in that area and your same with games or, or web and mobile and so on you would do a project in that area so when you are applying for jobs uh, you know you'll have a fairly substantial project that you've done in that specific area which you can show to your uh, prospective employer that's really interesting I think it's great that the University of London offers seven different specialisms you know it's a really unique point about this degree they can really tailor it to the way that they want um but very interesting to know that cybersecurity is coming up i'd love to hear about that development but let's go on to the next slide shall we so a lot of students ask because it's an online degree they want to understand if there's opportunities for students to collaborate with peers both within the online platform and through their group projects yeah so that's there's a really uh interesting or or valuable component of, of the degree experience, which is not really obvious when you look at the documentation. And this is the Slack community. So there's a Slack workspace dedicated to the degree students, only degree students have access to. And that workspace is uh, very lively, as I understand, it's like a student led space. So it's like a big old student common room, really, uh, where, but it, it's, it's like a student building because there's all these separate rooms, right? Uh, so for different modules and there's a whole, so study groups happen in there, all kinds of things happen in there. So that's a really interesting thing. And, and it's worth remembering that because it's an online degree and it's an international degree, you've got people from, you know, 150 countries or whatever in, in the degree. So in that space, you can meet people from all over the world and have really, and also a lot of those people are also are already working in the industry. So we have a, a surprising number of students who are already working in, in IT jobs and computing jobs who, who are studying. And, and so it's a good opportunity to network as well. So yeah, so that's a really interesting and valuable part of the degree that relates to collaboration with peers. Uh, but there's also sort of more formal collaboration where there are I think depending on which level six modules you take, but you could do up to uh, three modules where group work is required. So the web dev module at the moment requires group work and that's level four. And then second level, level five, you do the agile software projects module where you, you have to work with a group and also the games development module at level six is a group work module. But that's really great to understand. And I think the common question I get from a lot of students, and I know my fellow enrollment counsellors do as well, is when it comes to the group projects, if you have students, and one of the best things about this degree is that you can work with students from all over the world, 150 countries plus, as we said, um, how would they manage to do the group projects? Like, how would they manage to communicate with another? For example, if we have a student in Brazil, someone based in France, it's different hours. So how have students in the past historically managed to go around that? Yeah, so we use Slack basically. So what happens is when you when we have one of these group work projects, and uh, it when you get put into the group, the platform generates a channel for that group on Slack, and you kind of flow through into that, and that's where the discussion takes place. And because it's asynchronous, 
uh, you know, you can be in different time zones and catch up with the messages at different times and people arrange convenient times to meet with each other and things like that. So we kind of leave it to the students to, to some extent, but that's the platform we provide to, to enable that. And yeah, so a lot of people have really good experiences, you know, I will say that on campus as well, you know, group work is the big challenge, you know, you know, what happens when you get into a group with people who don't work and all of this. And so we've, we've used, we've had quite experienced people carefully design our group work modules so that that isn't, is, is minimized as an issue because we think that the positive benefit of, of doing a group group work is is worth it basically for, for the sort of mild risk uh, attached to it. But typically, uh, you know, we make it possible that, even if you're in a failing group, you can you can uh, deliver a, a successful project, uh, and we allow for that uh, individual submissions and things like that in in certain circumstances. So yeah, so we've we've carefully set the groups up so they do help you succeed even when things aren't ideal, but also uh, when when you, uh, most people have a really positive experience in the groups. That's really great to understand. Thank you so much for answering that. I really appreciate it. If we go on to the next slide. Thank you. So um, can you provide in information about the faculty teaching in the program? Are they experienced in online education and industry professionals? I know you mentioned earlier in the call and the Zoom meeting that obviously we have, you know, professors with PhDs, been working with faculty. So if you could expand on that, I'd love to understand a bit more. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, so in terms of... So what's worth knowing is that the... The people that, that we assign to teach the modules, um, they are yeah, members of faculty. And when it comes to their experience with online learning, um, the, the, there's it's not just them, it's also the people that design the module in the first place. So typically, you know, a lot of the people that are module leaders are actually the people that design the module. So that's great, but that wasn't always possible. You know, someone designed a module in 2020, maybe they end up moving on somewhere else. So we've got, for example, some of our module leaders now work in industry. We, uh, so Matty Hoban, one of our module leaders, is now working in a quantum computing research lab. Uh, and uh, Simon Catan, I think, is now working on some sort of educational computing platform. Uh, so we, we people do flow between academia and industry and that, that some of them have worked on the program. So yeah, uh, they're all uh, experienced, typically experienced educators, the people that run the modules. And, you know, we also make quite a lot of effort to make sure that everybody knows uh, we share information and we have regular meetings with all of our module leaders and check in to make sure that good practice is shared and that, that they know what they're supposed to be doing basically and how to deliver because it's quite i mean the, the the bsc is quite a specific design of, of how to deliver a program so you know there is a certain amount of specialized information relating just to this program that we we, we help uh, people learn when they come in new and also we've got this sort of online tutor community and actually the tutors help some of the module leaders sometimes as well because we've got some very experienced tutors who've been working on the modules for many sessions and so there's there's all kinds of sort of latent knowledge floating around in in our team and so we just make sure that we try and share that as best we can well, it's a great collaboration i think but yeah thank you so much for answering that i i appreciate we have 10 more minutes so i just wanted to ask you the last question and then we can crack on with the live q a as i can see there's been loads of questions and we will get to them so thank you so much for everyone answering them uh, well the last question we've kind of already answered but i guess we could talk a bit more about the assessment part as well but how would the assessments be conducted for online students you know um, I'm assuming, obviously, this is an online degree, so there wouldn't be that much of an on-campus requirements like it used to, because obviously it's changed after COVID, but just wanted to understand a bit more about the assessment side, really. Yeah, so each module has two hard deadlines for assessment, in one at the midterm, so they run for 20, 22 weeks, so you normally have a midterm assessment during a, around week 10, depending on which module it is, and that's a course, that's always a coursework, the midterm at the moment, it's always a coursework and that you submit that you know as a set of files and then it gets assessed uh, and, you know and you have several weeks to work on it and then the end of term um, um, assessment is either an exam or a coursework and if it's a coursework then depending on the module uh, if it's a coursework then it'll be the same as the midterm you know you just submit some files at some point in time 
by a deadline and um, then whereas if it's an exam then you will go onto this exam platform i mentioned earlier which is called inspira and you go on there uh, at a specific time on a specific day and you have a certain amount of time to take your exam and you then you, you basically type your answers into the platform and it has drawing and math mathematical formula capabilities as well so that's how that works and so it's all fully online that's great. Thank you. And for any students who have any questions about that, hopefully that's answered it for you. Um, but great. Let's go on to the live Q&A, shall we? So thank you, everyone, for listening so far. I really do appreciate it. And thank you so much to Anke and Diana once again for answering these questions. Um, I can see that there are some fantastic questions here. But one of the questions that I wanted to ask you, Matthew, if that's OK, is um, one of the questions is, how can I get involved in undergraduate research in my first year? Um, that's interesting. Yeah, undergraduate research. So, I mean, typically, you know, research happens when you have a PhD and you, you, you become a postdoctoral researcher, but uh, your own research would happen during your PhD potentially as well. Uh, but um, sometimes people do it at a master's level. So I would, eh, but I would say that research does kind of happen at level six as well. So in, in the undergraduate degree, uh, sometimes people do research in their project, which is of a standard where it could actually be published at a conference, for example, and that's people who are getting very high grades might be able to do that. Uh, so that's that's when research would happen uh, in terms of sort of research that's related to stuff that's happening on, you know, here, that, that what researchers are doing. There isn't really a direct route for doing that at the moment, um, but it's an interesting idea, the idea of undergraduates working in, in research teams. But yeah, typically, that's that's when research would happen, I would say, towards when you're later through the degree, level six, and you're doing those specialist modules and you're doing your final project. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, we have another really pressing question is, um, obviously, as we mentioned in the webinar earlier, will University of London introduce cybersecurity specialisations in level six in the future? And if yes, when? Yeah, so uh, we we haven't finalised the schedule for this project where we're we're sort of redeveloping the program yet, uh, but uh, we're certainly looking at uh, the possibility of of new specialisms. So uh, I can't really give you a firm answer on that yet, but that, that we've 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 been in discussion with Coursera about the fact that people are keen to see a cybersecurity specialism on the degree, and we you know we're looking into how we we can deliver that. Sure, and I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Um, we still have a few more questions and um, we have about uh, five minutes left. So let's go through this. Um, one question is from Noel. Will we get a physical certificate for the course? Just to let you know, Noel, yes, you will. You will get a degree certificate from the University of London. Doesn't state that it's an online degree, nor does the state it's from Coursera as well. And you can attend a physical graduation ceremony as well and wear a gown and a cap and uh you know walk on stage and be presented with the degree certificate everyone loves that i know my mum does she has pictures of all of us in our graduation caps and gowns so if anyone wants to come to that you can attend it's not a problem at all but just to let you know you won't be um you'll have to pay for your own travel and accommodation just so that you're aware but if you can't attend don't worry university of london will post it through to you in the mail okay so Let's go through a few more questions. I have, oh, what percentage of graduates go on to pursue a master's or a PhD after doing the University of London's computer science degree? Do we have any information on that at all? Yeah, I don't, I don't have percentages, but I'm, certain, I'm certainly aware that a lot of students are go into master's courses. I know we've had people accepted. Recently, I heard of someone went on to uh, an on-campus masters at imperial which you've probably heard of uh from from the degree so that was great and i know we've got people applying to all kinds of places i heard about someone applying to georgia tech the other day so yes yeah, only people are applying for masters and you know a, a uk bsc degree is designed to set you up for masters internationally i would say as well so yeah that's great thank you um to this question, this degree is with an honours. So this is a UK honours degree. Um, so it will be a level six UK qualification that you'll be receiving. Um, 
I have one more question for you, Matthew. This is from Adrian. Will online students have the opportunity to collaborate with on-campus students by any chance? Uh, we don't have an explicit route for that yet. Uh, so, but that's again, another interesting idea, but it's quite difficult to organize uh, ultimately. But uh, yeah, so we, we do have some students who have transitioned from the uh, online program to on-campus and a few who've actually gone from on-campus to online. So, but they don't, collaborate as it were uh, so yeah no, nothing in place yet for that but yeah it's an interesting idea it is it is um i actually have one more question uh, it's coming up quite a few times but how competitive is the entry into the bachelor's degree of computer science program with the university of london in your opinion um so we Competitive normally means there's a limited number of places, and so therefore the sort of the people are filtered uh, who can get onto the degree. But the only filter we currently apply is whether you meet the entrance criteria. So if you meet the entrance criteria, you you can go onto the degree. We don't have a limited number of spaces currently. Fantastic. So for those who have just heard, if you meet the entry requirements, you can apply through standard. But if you feel like you don't and you don't know if you apply for performance based, uh, feel free to book a meeting in with an enrollment counsellor. You can scan the QR code on the screen now and we can help you go through any questions or queries. We're here to help. Um, for Alexander, there is the October intake and then there is an April intake. So Matthew, just to uh, keep me honest here, there are two cohorts every year, if, if I'm correct. Yeah, that's correct. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for all these questions. And thank you so much, Matthew, for answering all of these. I really appreciate it um, and all the time that you've taken. Um, your insight and knowledge was fantastic. And I'm sure the students enjoyed it just as much as I did. So if we go on to the last slide. I just want to say, before we wrap up, I really encourage you to connect with an enrollment counsellor. We're really happy to answer any questions you might have, anything you'd want to know about the programme, about the University of London. We're here to help. Um, and we'll send out the recording of the webinar in a follow-up email, and you can schedule an appointment there, or click on the meeting link in the chat box below that Diana and Ankit will share. Um, but I just want to say, once again, thank you so much to Matthew for all your knowledge and all your time. I really, really appreciate it. Any last words of wisdom before we let you go? Yeah, th thanks, Nisha. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, you know, just remember that the the unique aspects of the degree, I suppose, you know, just remember that you're joining this international huge community of, of students uh, and you're, you'll meet some really interesting people on the degree. So don't think of it just being you studying on your own. You know, it's really a, a great community and a very helpful and knowledgeable community that you'll join when you, you when you join the degree. And that's maybe not so obvious when you look at the information online and stuff like that. So I just want to emphasize that. Thank you so much. And yeah, it's been running so successfully since April 2019. The computer science uh, community is humongous. So if you want to know more information, book a meeting with an enrollment counsellor and we'll be happy to help. But yes, once again, thank you so much to everyone. Uh, good afternoon, good evening and good night. Thank you, everyone. See you later.